You ever heard the saying that you don't stop flying the airplane until you turn the engine off? Well, that is a good rule of thumb to follow because we had our first prop strike. How's it going everybody? Welcome back to Mojo Grip Mike here. So today is day number eight. Depending on when this video comes out, this incident happened about a week ago and it was involving a student pilot. We had an incident on the runway which is a, which was a prop strike. Now, if you're not familiar with what a prop strike is, you can just go on YouTube or Google it. Prop strike is self-explanatory. Basically, you strike your prop on an object, and usually it's the pavement or something else around the runway. And in this case, it was a pilot coming in to land. They thought they had it, but they didn't, and yada, 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 which could have been worse, but the good news is that nobody got hurt during this accident. Uh, and generally speaking, prop strikes are not uh, severe or fatal for the most part. Uh, the only thing that gets hurt usually in a prop strike is the airplane. So it means you have to spend money to repair the aircraft. But let's talk about a few factors here and why I'm even making this video public, right? I should not even make this video, but I always try to use the situations as a learning curve, both from a pilot perspective, but also from a flight school perspective and this happened at our flight school lookupflightschool.com make sure you check us out if you're looking to get your pilot's license and or if you're looking to pursue a career as a professional pilot we can get you from zero all the way to the airlines and you're flying the most modern airplane period okay check us out lookupflightschool.com all right so on a perfect nice day pilot is coming into land clear to land everything looks good and boom they get on the runway and what happened was that they tried to land the airplane and it bounced. And rather than maybe trying something different, the pilot tried to force the airplane down, which is the first lesson that we'll talk about here. Now, take this video as not an instruction video. This is just for my own opinion. I'm not a flight instructor, nor am I an expert, but I know a little bit of a little bit. So when you have a not so good approach and or landing, right? You land the plane when the airplane safely touches and cruises down the runway. That's, to me, that's a landing. Anything else that doesn't look like the airplane touching the ground and it's glued to the ground cruising along, if you have a bounce up, if you get moved or tossed to the side by wind or something, then you should genuinely, seriously consider the next safe option, which is go around. This may be one of the safest tool that you learn as a student. Now, I understand once you've gotten your pilot's license, you get more experience under your belt, you have more skills, you can play around with things when it comes to landing, but you always wanna leave that room to go around, especially as a student. When you have your pilot's license and you're just flying around, I get the idea of wanting to just get the airplane down. And I, I have this sometimes too, get their itis, where after a long trip, if you've been in the air for three, four hours, you just want to get down. So you want to get that airplane down all means necessary, right? And I've shared some of my terrible landings with you guys. But when you're still a student or more particularly in a training environment, go around is actually something you want to be purposeful about, even when you don't need it, right? Let's assume that you had a perfect landing or you had a perfect approach and you just need to practice going around. It is crucial to learn the art of going around because prop strikes are accidents that can be avoided 100% of the time. It usually involves landing. And sometimes wind is a factor, sometimes wind is not. It's just the pilot in the airplane. You think you've made the runway, but you haven't had your airplane in the right setting or whatever the case may be. But rather than going around, you force that airplane down and then you cost yourself a lot of money and then time. So let's talk about the actual cost of a prop strike. When your airplane has a prop strike, generally speaking, you have to replace the prop, which is the case here. So prop needs to be replaced. Your engine needs to go through an inspection. Sometimes you may need to tear the engine completely down, depending on the make and model. Oftentimes you don't have to do all of that, 
but still get the engine inspected, gearbox, crankshaft, all that. And also, more than likely, your nose gear also needs to be checked and or replaced. So you're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars in repair costs that could have been avoided. And you know, nothing in aviation is cheap. I don't care what shop you go to. And then you also have the lead time because sometimes parts take longer. So you may have to wait weeks or months to get a new propeller, a new strut for your nose gear. If you need to get a new engine or part of the engine, that can take a long time. So now you have the airplane sitting, you have thousands of dollars in bills, you may choose to file through your insurance. And if you do that, you also run the risk of your premium going up because of an incident. And speaking of insurance, in a flight training environment, it is crucial for the student pilot also to have insurance. See, we get insurance because we wanna plan for the worst. We don't get it just because it's required. Technically, it's not required. Aviation is actually one of the few industries where insurance for the equipment is not required. If you buy an airplane today, you're not required by law to insure that airplane. You can insure it yourself, but you run the risk of when something happens, you have to pay out of pocket. This is why you get insurance for your airplane. So in a training environment, absolutely crucial for the student also to have a renter's insurance policy. So for all my student pilots out there, if your school has not required you to get a renter's insurance policy, you probably want to get one anyway, just to be on the safe side, because you may have a prop strike or you just may be involved in an incident. And again, prop strike are generally not severe where there's no bodily injury. But if there was an incident where someone gets injured or somebody else's property gets damaged, then you would be liable for that cost. So make sure you get insurance and make sure the school or whoever owns that aircraft also has insurance. Now, let's get back to pilotage. We've talked about going around. The other factor that plays into this is communication. If you're flying in a towered airport, you have to get instructions to land, right? You request to land and usually tower tells you you're cleared or they tell you to extend whatever the case may be. But as a student pilot, you should never forget this one nugget. And that is you still have the final say, especially if you're flying solo. Even if tower tells you one thing and you don't feel safe doing that one thing, you're still piloting command. Tower is not the one flying the airplane. So say for example, you request for landing, you're coming in and something is up with your approach or you don't feel like you're going to get this thing down or maybe you're too high or too low, whichever the case may be. Even if it's a busy environment and the tower really wants to get you down, it is still your final say, right? It is still up to you to land that airplane or have another request and say, I'm going to go around or I'm going to do this or do this. Tower is not pilot in command. You are. And unfortunately, I've seen incidents and even in some cases, fatal accidents happen because the pilot is so dependent on the instructions that they're getting from Tower. An accident that comes to mind is one that happened a few years ago in Houston, Texas involving a Cirrus. I remember just watching the report and listening to the audio of that accident and just feeling terrible for the pilot because she did everything that was asked of her. Cirrus 4252 Golf at 1,500 feet. Cirrus 4252 Golf Hobby Tower, you number two following a 737 on a three mile final, cautionary turbulence from a four clear to land. She was coming into land at what seems like an extremely busy airport where you had commercial flights going in and out. Zero, zero, one, five, gust to two, zero. Okay, thank you. Trying to lose altitude, 425, two, golf. No problem. A little bit of wind off the right. Zero, five, two, golf. Uh, if you don't want to land, that's too high. We can put you back around the downwind. Don't force it if you can't. Okay, we'll see. Thank you. 425, two, golf. 20 seconds later, it's apparent that 425, two, golf is still too high on the approach. The Cirrus has already crossed the runway threshold when the tower speaks up. Okay, I think you're too high, Cirrus. Uh, five to, uh, five to golf. You might be too high. Okay, well, could go around then. Four to five to golf. It's not clear if the pilot hadn't yet made the determination that she was too high or if she was still trying to salvage the approach. The Cirrus begins the second go around. 
Two is five two golf Roger. Just uh, okay. Just you're just gonna make a right traffic now for runway three five. We'll come back around and we got it this time. Three five cleared to land. Trying to get down again. Four two five two golf. No problem. Four two five two golf is unable to lose enough altitude. The pilot initiates a third go around. Four two five two golf going around. Third time will be a charm. Just before the Cirrus announces the go-around, a new tower controller has taken over. As 4252 Gulf is climbing, the controller proposes a new plan and instructs the pilot to make left traffic. He also reassigns the Cirrus to runway 4. Okay, uh, Cirrus uh, 52 Gulf, just go ahead and make the left turn now to enter the uh, downwind, midfield downwind for only 4. If you can, just keep me a nice, low, tight pattern. I'm going to have traffic four miles behind you, so I need you to just kind of keep it in tight if you could. Okay, this time it'll be runway four, turning left, 4252 golf. Yeah, and actually I might end up sequencing you behind that traffic. It's on four miles a minute. Um, it is going to be a little bit tight with the uh, one behind it. So uh, when you get on that downwind, stay on the downwind. Advise me when you have that 737 in sight. We'll either do four or we might swing you around to three five. But as the controller is speaking, tragedy strikes. The Cirrus in a climbing left turn suddenly drops a wing. Uh, uh, ma'am, ma'am, uh, straighten up, straighten up. It's too late. The Cirrus falls rapidly, spinning toward the ground below. It makes impact in a parking lot just outside the airport, killing all three aboard. And they gave her instructions over and over again to go around, to extend. But because she was so heavily dependent on the instructions even you can hear at one point tower telling her to curve you know make the turn tight when you're low to the ground you risk stalling the airplane when you're banking at a very high or steep degree you don't want to do steep turns when you're so low to the ground when you listen to that audio you can see the communication and back and forth with the tower and the pilot and i just thought man if the pilot just for one second thought Man, this is probably a little too much. She could have diverted. She could have possibly found a neighboring airport to land, or she could have told the tower to get a different option. But in this case, she may have been flying for a long time and she just wanted to get down. And unfortunately, they try to squeeze her in between commercial flights. And she did a very fatal maneuver in the end that turned into a fatal accident. So this is why I say, especially as a student, understand that you are still pilot in command. It doesn't matter what Tower tells you. Their job is also to keep you safe. But if you get an instruction and things are not looking right, it is your full right and responsibility to ask for a different option or just say negative. You are a pilot in command. And the last point I wanna make with this video is humility. As a student pilot, humble, humble, humble yourself at all times especially when you're post solo. So when you first start training, you know, you go through this gauntlet and finally you get to fly the airplane yourself. Now, after that first solo, you might get this false pretense that says you are the greatest pilot in the world. And you probably are. I mean, you've achieved the significant thing of flying the airplane yourself, but you have to understand that you're still a student pilot and there's still a ton that you don't know. So when you go for that first solo, great. You've been able to fly the airplane, take off and land by yourself. But also understand that consistency is what follows. If you go solo today and then you don't fly for a week or two weeks or a month, and then you decide to come back and try to solo the airplane again, that's probably not a good idea. Post solo still means you have a ton to learn till you get to check right, till you get your certificate, and even after you fly. I believe all pilots are students for life. So remember to humble yourself as a student pilot and you don't end up with a prop strike. That is my spiel for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm curious if you've ever had a prop strike, let me know in the comments below what that was like and how much it costs to fix that airplane. Thank you so much for watching. Again, my name is Mike. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, Give it a thumbs up and I will catch you on the next video. Peace.